Good morning. And happy Halloween, Brooks. Um, I know I love all these costumes. They are truly magnificent to see. Special shout out to the Loraxes over there. You guys are absolutely killing it. So let's give a round of applause to them, please. Nice job. So I wanted to share, this is actually a photo of me when I was a kid um, in my all-time, I know, right? In my all-time favorite Halloween costume, which is Dracula. Um, so this is me all the way back, way back in the mid-1980s when I was around six years old. And you can tell it's the 80s because of my turtleneck and my bangs, which were absolute high fashion at that time. Um, I was about to go trick-or-treating in my apartment building in New York City, which is where I grew up. And I remember that I thought I looked amazing, like absolutely perfect, do not change anything. Okay, my eyes are closed, I will mention, because I was a vampire, right? And the sun was still up, and I was trying to not evaporate like vampires do when they're in the sun, and it worked because I'm still here today. So think about it. Um, I've given versions of this speech before here at Brooks, so parts of what I say this morning might sound familiar. Okay, I like to give a speech on Halloween, because Halloween is one of my favorite holidays. I love that we spend a night each fall watching scary movies, making jack-o'-lanterns, and sending our children to go ask the neighbors for candy. But really, historically and spiritually, we're doing a lot more than just that. The great Michael Scott of The Office once said that Halloween should be a day on which we honor monsters and not be mad at each other, and he's right. Halloween happens at a certain time of year. It's 70 degrees today, but it's that gray area between fall and winter, between the long days and the long nights, between growth and dormancy, between this life and the next one. From its earliest origins, Halloween has given us a space to talk about the scary things, the mysterious things that we can see coming as the weather changes, as the world gets colder and darker, less certain and more frightening. Throughout its history, Halloween has also given people a chance to get together with their community before they go back into their houses and shut their doors against the long, cold night. Halloween has a long history that stretches across all these different cultures, but its ideas are consistent. The Celts, who lived 2,000 years ago in Northern Europe, celebrated their new year around what today is November 1st. The summer was over, the harvest was over, and the winter, a dark, cold, scary time was beginning. On the night before the new year, so October 31st, the Celts also believed that the wall between the world of the living and the world of the dead became permeable, and that ghosts and spirits would return to our world, the world of the living. To these ancient people, this night before the new year encompassed a lot of really heavy emotions, a celebration of a harvest season ending, an acknowledgement of those they had lost, an uncertain hope for the future, and a collective shoring up against the coming winter. They built huge bonfires like that one, at which they gathered to celebrate their community as much as they did their ghosts. When the celebration was over, and this is really important, each house would take a torch from the bonfire to relight its own fire at home with. And the writer in me, the English teacher in me, I love a good symbol, right? They took a part of their entire community home with them to help them stay warm during the cold, dark winter to come. So why does this matter today? I know what you're thinking, right? It's the year 2024. We are hopefully not planning to build a bonfire on the soccer field later. We pretty much have it all figured out. These days, more than 90% of the world's population has a smartphone. We all have the entire body of human knowledge, literally in the palm of our hands, immediately available. We use technology to communicate and build community and learn every day in ways that the ancient Celts and even just our own grandparents could have never imagined. We talk to family and friends on the other side of the world. We can open up our laptops and watch a live stream of a soccer game happening on a different continent. We can zoom in on a page in a book in a library across an ocean. And I'm guessing that when Taylor Swift finally releases Rep TV, we'll all know about it within minutes or if you live in Thorn, within 30 seconds. All the music, all the poetry, all the stories that our minds, hearts, and souls have ever created and loved is right there, just waiting for us. And it's not just our ability to access information on each other quickly that's changed. We know a lot more about how our world works than we used to. 
Even in just the last few years, scientists found a woolly mammoth encased inside a glacier. So woolly mammoths have been extinct for 4,000 years, but these scientists isolated its genes, and they're going to grow, they plan to, a new, fully living, legit real woolly mammoth by the year 2027. Space tourism is no longer just this wild possibility, it's a reality. We all saw the videos a couple weeks ago. Just last spring, we all knew to go outside right after last class on April 8th and look up into the sky together and watch a solar eclipse because scientists can calculate the exact movements of the Earth, Moon, and Sun down to the second. And a few years ago, this kid, whose name is Haley, threw out the first pitch at a World Series game using a hand that was built on a 3D printer. And I will say that as a Yankees fan, I don't want to talk about the World Series at all today, except for this moment here. I do not want to talk about it. Now, it was rough. We could look at this and see that we know it all. We've found ways to negate extinction, disability, nature, and even the vacuum of outer space. We don't carry questions, doubts, or mysteries, and we don't need the light of that bonfire. But the thing is, we don't really have it all figured out at all. In fact, we don't know the answers to some pretty basic questions. For example, although we have figured out how to bring that woolly mammoth back to life, scientists have a surprising amount of trouble explaining why the ice it was buried in for so long is slippery. We're starting to send paying customers into outer space, but we haven't explored 90% of our own ocean. We can predict the exact movements of the sun, moon, and earth, these immense celestial bodies, but we can't really explain how birds and butterflies know where they're going when they migrate across our own planet. And we can build prosthetic hands on a 3D printer out of nothing, but we don't know, and this is true, across cultures, continents, and time periods, we don't know why parents overwhelmingly tend to carry their babies in their left arms. I carried all three of my kids right here in my left arm when they were little, which is the reason why I had this tattoo placed here on my left arm. And parents in the audience, I know it's super sweet. Parents in the audience, I bet you carried your kids in your left arms also. So there are always unknowns in life. There are always questions to which we have no good answers. I believe the two biggest questions we have no good answers to are one, we'll never know what happens to us when our lives are over. And two, we'll never know what's out there in the dark, waiting for us in the spaces we fear the most. Those two questions, which come from the deepest part of our human instincts, cause us to ask even more lizard brain type questions, supernatural Halloween questions about our world. For example, what is that thing you see in your peripheral vision sometimes? And why can't you ever really get a clear look at it? What did my childhood dog see when she growled into that dark corner of my parents' kitchen after everybody else had gone to bed? How come, when we're walking around, we sometimes feel like there's someone or something right behind us, catching up to us, reaching for us, even when we know for a fact, for a scientific, objectively true fact, that we're alone? And if we do know for sure, for a scientific, objectively true fact, that we're alone, why do we walk faster? Maybe this unknown is why, to this day, I still avoid the kitchen in my parents' house late at night. Maybe this is why all the kids in my six-year-old daughter's day camp group here at Brooks ended the summer absolutely, resolutely convinced that a witch lives in that tiny brown house across the lake from the boathouse. And I know that they are not the first group of day campers to believe that. Maybe this is why the little kids on campus, a few of whom have lived here since they were babies, being carried in my left arm and the left arms of my colleagues, and who know this campus better than almost anybody, look out from the field toward the lake and talk about the man named Robert, who, get this, stands on the end of the fire trail by the boathouse, holding up a lantern and waving to them at night. It is super creepy. Maybe this is why there are ghost stories about so many of our campus spaces. I'm thinking about that corner double on the third floor of Thorn and that portrait hanging in PBA. This crack of doubt, this is what today's Halloween is all about. 
We set aside time to name what we're scared of and let ourselves be scared of it. We set aside time to let ourselves just not know all the answers and not have full control over our world. And we set aside time to do this as a community, together, around a metaphorical bonfire and real jack-o'-lanterns. For one night, we reassure each other that I also don't know what the dog sees over there, but wow, that creeps me out too. You know, maybe I think I did also see a light flickering out there over the lake one night. You're not the only one who gets scared. You're not the only one who doesn't know the answer. And you're not the only one who has questions. Halloween is a chance to celebrate with each other that, even though we know so much about our world and have so much access to information, art, beauty, knowledge in each other, we don't know it all. We're vulnerable. We can be frightened. We're human. But it's okay because we can be unknowing and vulnerable and frightened and human together. It's 2024 and we still come together as a community, a campus, a bunch of kids trick-or-treating. We still build our bonfire and light our jack-o'-lanterns. We still say hello and smile as you pass out candy. And we each go home with, if not an actual torch for our actual fire, the knowledge that we're not alone and that we'll be there for each other through the winter and the long nights that are coming. Once in a while, times are hard and things are scary. All of the time, we can offer compassion and love and help each other the best we can. Once in a while, we're not sure why things happen the way they do. All of the time, we can ask our questions. Once in a while, we do the wrong thing. We hurt each other. All of the time, we can remember that we're not perfect and we're not built to be. And we can give each other grace and space to make mistakes and find each other again. Once in a while, once a year, it's actually October 31st, it's actually Halloween. But all of the time, we can celebrate the dark and all the truths we don't know. All of the time, we can name and own and be proud of our fears and questions. All of the time, we can get together to celebrate our own humanity, both its perfections and its imperfections. And all of the time, we can bring a piece of our community home with us to help keep us warm when we're alone and in the dark. Happy Halloween, Brooks. Thank you.